Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our free webinar, Three Simple Steps to Switch Your Practice to Telemedicine, featuring Galena Roof. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Manager here at LASA OMS. This event is co-sponsored with the Florida State Oriental Medical Association, and we were supposed to have their secretary, Dr. Jennifer Bradwell, join us today to just talk about Florida State Association a little bit, but unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties right at the beginning, and we were not able to get her on screen. I'll try to get her on at the end of the webinar to say a few important messages. Um, so a little about LASA OMS. For over 40 years, we have been striving to promote the growth of the acupuncture industry, providing quality products, great prices, and the best customer service, as well as supporting the many schools and continuing education efforts available. With our free webinar series, we intend to provide free educational opportunities taught by some of our industry's most renowned practitioners and educators. I would like to take a moment to acclimate you to the webinar room. We recommend viewing the webinar in Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, as you can experience slowness in other browsers. To the right of the video screen, you will see three tabs, chat, question, and polls. To chat with other attendees or to communicate any technical difficulties, please use the chat tab. For questions, please use the questions tab to assure that our guest answers them at the end of our lecture. And actually, I just noticed that Jennifer is on stage with me right now, so I'm going to let Jennifer say a few words about the Florida State Oriental Medical Association. Hi, Jennifer. Hi there, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thanks to LASA for your continued support of our profession and also for SOMA. And thank you so much, Galena, for so generously sharing your knowledge, uh, your longtime for SOMA membership. You're always one of our most popular speakers at our conference, so thank you so much. And I just want to say that we do understand what a difficult time this is right now, both personally and professionally. We do hope that each of you are practicing really good self-care right now so that you're able to care for your families, your communities, and your patients. Um, and we just want to let you know that FASOMA is committed to Florida acupuncturists. Our mission is to protect, to promote, and to support the profession. We set up a COVID-19 resource page that's available on the homepage of our website, and that is FASOMA.org. And with our 11 volunteer board members and our team, we are continuously updating this as more information is available. We're also trying to share as much as we can on our FASOMA Facebook page just to keep you up to date on the latest information as we know it. And I know that all of us want to be sure right now that we're really following all guidelines and that we're using best practices to be able to show the incredible intelligence and wisdom of our beloved medicine so that we can ensure public safety and the effectiveness of our medicine. We encourage you to check out a new doc that we've uploaded. It is a best herbal practice doc. It is also available on that COVID-19 page for more information when you are using and recommending herbal medicine. And lastly, all of our updates are available to all licensed acupuncturists on our homepage. We are so grateful to our members whose support allows us to continue to work to promote and protect and support the practice of oriental medicine. So thank you all so much. And Galena, I'm really looking forward to learning more on today's talk. So thank you. Thank you so um, much, Jennifer. And I, what I wanted to everybody is that if you're having an issue with hearing any notification sounds, right at the top of the page, there's a little bell icon. I would like all of you to click that and that will limit the amount of notifications. And actually, Galena, I would ask you to do that too if you haven't done that yet. Um, so now I'm just gonna quickly introduce um, Galena. So Galena Rufner is a nationally board certified Ohio and Florida state licensed acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. She serves on the State Medical Board of Ohio's Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine Advisory Panel on the subject of Chinese herbs and other modalities of Oriental medicine. She is a member of the Hospital-Based Practice Task Force Committee Advisory Panel for the NCCAOM, and currently Galena works for the Lincoln Clinic as an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. She has a great passion for teaching, and presently she is an NCCAOM-approved continuing education provider and speaks at many conferences. Please join me in welcoming Galena Rufner. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey, uh, on behalf of LASA. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, on behalf of SOMA. Uh, it is a great honor for me to share the knowledge which I have acquired. I have been practicing telemedicine for quite a while now. 
uh, administration of Cleveland Clinic approached me four years ago with request for telemedicine. And just to rewind back a little bit, uh, um, we started a traditional Chinese herbal medicine clinic within the Wellness Institute Integrated Medicine Department at Cleveland Clinic uh, six years ago, a little bit more than six years. Um, appointments for herbal clinic are completely separate from acupuncture. That is a big distinguishing factor contrary of our private practices. The reason for that, not every patient is suitable for herbal medicine. Not every um, patient can qualify for uh, receiving herbal uh, medicine to medications or other factors. And it's also for convenience of administrative handling and billing purposes. So coming back to uh, four years ago, it took for me a little while to figure out how to practice telemedicine legally and still to the um, standards of our profession. I will be speaking that um, a little bit later in the webinar. So right now, let's uh, start first with uh, um, important uh, um, decision. Are you a subject uh, for telemedicine law? And yes, you are. The moment you hold healthcare license anywhere within the United States, you are performing assessments, you are establishing the diagnosis, uh, you are creating the treatment plan, um, you are a subject for regulation. One of the remarks which I want to say for the diagnosis, uh, please adhere to um, our education and to make a traditional medicine diagnosis, which is a pattern diagnosis. It's not a Western medical diagnosis. And specifically in regard of uh, COVID, we um, cannot make a diagnosis of COVID. It's only uh, via the test. All which we can do, we can treat symptoms such as uh, um, fever, uh, um, cough, and any of them. So the most clearly probably uh, um, designation of healthcare providers is outlined in the Florida um, state, but it is national. It's not uh, only to one state. And you can see clearly outlined list of telehealth providers. We as acupuncturists are definitely on that list. The most important question which remains there, can we practice telemedicine as traditional medicine providers across the state lines? No, we cannot. We have to practice in the state that we hold a license. And even with the uh, latest uh, uh, release of uh, uh, federal government, law which has relaxed uh, cross-state licensing rules does not apply to us. It applies only to physician and physician assistants. We must still practice in the state where we are licensed. Um, or in other words, we can must be licensed in the state where a patient resides. The only exempt um, at all the times, not necessary or only during a COVID emergency, um, it's those who practice for VA. But there is a catch. As a VA practitioner, if you are employed by VA, if you are obey the rules, it's up for you to find out with your administration, can you in any possible way um, prescribe herbs? You still can act within an acupuncture scope of practice. You definitely can offer um, self um, acupressure for the patients, you can uh, guide them on other modalities of traditional medicine, 
but not necessarily prescribe herbs. So that's for you to find out. Let us take a look um, at difference of law across the states. And please keep in mind, we are subject of regulation, not only telemedicine law, which applies to all providers uh, um, across the United States, but we also a subject of regulation according to the practice of acupuncture or Oriental medicine or East Asian medicine, whichever legal language your state uses. And not every state uh, um, has the same um, law. Like, for example, in the state of Ohio, in our Oriental medicine law, I must initially meet a patient in person, which is a very big barrier right now for telemedicine. On another end, in the state of Florida, there is absolutely nothing, to the best of my knowledge, which is written in my acupuncture physician uh, practice, which would prohibit me from meeting patient in person. And in the state of Ohio, uh, excuse me, in, in state of Florida, telemedicine law specifically states that I can establish relationships with the patient for initial appointment um, via telemedicine software. So another um, intricate question which we always face is billing for uh, uh, telehealth and it does not matter, is it in the uh, um, current state of COVID or it's in general. Unfortunately, again, I want to highlight, we are a subject of obedience to acupuncture profession law. And for example, in state of Ohio, it clearly states that we shall not make a diagnosis. Unfortunately, that is saying prohibits us in state of Ohio to bill for evaluation and management costs. So accordingly, in state of Ohio, I cannot bill for telemedicine because the same exact rule applies to evaluation codes in person or in uh, telemedicine. And that is rooted in your state uh, scope of practice. So it's why be very careful. Um, as well, um, if we look in regards of billing, and I'm in no means uh, a billing um, professional. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, Lassa will be holding a webinar on um, billing practices. There is different billing codes. There is different requirements. Uh, the only uh, couple things which I want to mention that Medicare will not pay to us for uh, telemedicine services, exactly by the same reason why they don't pay to us for acupuncture, because we are not on the list of their providers. Same applies to Medicaid. And uh, um, let's say again, in state of Ohio, we can um, bill for acupuncture to Medicaid patients, but we cannot bill for evaluation and management codes, only for procedural acupuncture codes. So it's why uh, be careful and all billing practices uh, um, are based on private payers, Primarily, it probably will depend on individual uh, patient um, insurance policy. HIPAA requ requirements. What I have on the screen is a normal, stable, all the times HIPAA requirements. A normal, stable, regular requirements for telemedicine technology, we must use HIPAA compliant uh, um, software. And unfortunately, Facebook, FaceTime, uh, Skype, phone, not considered to be HIPAA compliant. But that's the only exception which is done 
at the current moment by federal government, and again, I want to stress it out for you, only during COVID emergency, we can use um, FaceTime, Skype, or even phone. Just make sure that in your notes, what you still have to maintain for every encounter with a patient, you make a notation that the encounter was face-to-face, via virtual visit, and you can make a note that it was uh, handled uh, um, via FaceTime and patient gave you a consent on use of FaceTime. But the moment uh, um, COVID emergency goes out, HIPAA compliance requirement rules will go right back on. So there are few platforms, and uh, I have attended uh, a few webinars. Um, there are, are some of the uh, free options. Like, let's say I use, uh, for some of my appointments, uh, a VC Clinic um, platform. They used to have a free version. version. There is some other uh, versions, like DoxyMe and so forth. Um, I had a lot of time. I had couple years to figure it all out, which platform to use, how to use, and what to do. And uh, um, I do telemedicine in the Cleveland Clinic that we use American Well, which is a very big company. It's like Epic. I try to uh, contact them um, to partner for my private practice as well. They <laughs> didn't want it even to talk with me. So the uh, company which I found, it's called VC Clinic. Uh, um, they were uh, really polite and open to a small practice practitioner. Um, and they are financially affordable. The difference between free plans on many platforms and uh, um, paid platforms is majority of the telemedicine paid platforms allow for the patient to enter a um, credit card before they log into appointment and you will process the payment at the end of the appointment and especially if you order in any other services it also can be added and test payment because unfortunately in majority of the cases you still will be operating on cash uh, basis for uh, telemedicine on the screen, what you see is actually uh, a patient screen. That there is the difference also between um, EMR platforms and uh, specific telemedicine platforms. Many of uh, EMR platforms don't have patient waiting room. Like let's say in my private practice, I use Charm HR. Um, platform for my record keeping and communication with the patient at the current moment. Uh, the problem is um, they are using a medical Zoom for connection with the patient and uh, um, then patient is directed to the uh, telemedicine encounter. They log in and all what they see is just a dark screen. There is absolutely nothing on that screen. And if I am late, for the appointment, which unfortunately does happen sometimes, even if it's a few minutes, patient is panicking. That's what is the benefit of specific telemedicine app platforms. That's in patient errors in the waiting room. They see uh, services which you are provide. You can roll information uh, on uh, the screen and they don't know that they are completely lost and unattended. So here is EHR platform. Uh, I literally just yesterday had a meeting with uh, Unified Practices. They did not had um, an option for a, a telemedicine. It became live, live and active just uh, um, literally a few uh, days ago. Those of you who use Unified Practice now that uh, uh, they are specifically acupuncturist geared. There is option uh, for um, herbal uh, inventory and so forth. Um, 
and other great thing which unified practices uh, offer for you right at the current moment is uh, um, no charge no additional charge for uh, telemedicine services for COVID uh, um, crisis. Um, with uh, uh, VC Clinic, then uh, I called them quite a while ago. I also uh, was able to negotiate discounted rates um, for uh, practitioners, and I have a link on uh, my class website to connect them um, for uh, Charmy, for um, Unified Prax uh, platform, you are welcome to uh, contact with them directly and they will set you up um, for uh, telehealth services. Why we really need all of those platforms? It's significantly easier to use uh, requirements for uh, um, well-written um, notes, especially for insurance reimbursements are more and more strict. Also in the future, we will be uh, switching to uh, electronic healthcare record platforms, mandatory. I assume the moment uh, um, ICD-11, which contains chapter 26, traditional medicine diagnosis will roll in. Um, that's how uh, your screen will um, look do virtual visits on unified practice platform. You will see the patient and you simultaneously can type your notes because the biggest caveat uh, with normal time telemedicine visits, it's still considered to be face-to-face -face appointment and it must be reflected in your notes. It's time-based billing and you have to literally write a sentence in your notes. I spent so many minutes face to face with the patient. Now let's just take a look at FDA regulations for our Chinese herbs. Yes, we are regulated. It's why we have to obey to certain criteria. Then we are administering herbs or from our own personal dispensary, or we can use a third party dispensary in my um, as Cleveland clinic practice as uh, in my private practice I do use for um, dispensing facility which allows much better compliance with FDA regulations if you are using um, your own dispensary please make sure that you are adhering to pre prescription label uh, with all FDA compliant requirements, making sure that your address is uh, uh, on the label, that all herbs are reflected, that clear allergy warning is on the label. And as well, please remember that we are still uh, the subject to FDA requirements on reporting adverse events which uh, might be happening. And in adverse event reporting um, form, which I actually have in one of my uh, classes, we must reflect the lot of the herbs. We must make sure that we adhere to expiration dates and all that. So lot of the herbs must be present in your notes for you could uh, uh, report if anything happens. Another important subject is standards for telemedicine uh, practice. Our documents still must reflect evaluation, including history, physical examination, and all other standards of practice, which are objective science which we must together. Independently, is it appointment in person in your office? or is it appointment via telemedicine? Objective science of traditional medicine is tongue and pulse. So, uh, tongue of your patient, uh, they can photograph at home and um, just to be sure that uh, 
I evaluate the tongue of my patients properly. It took for me a while to figure out how to accommodate for light changes on the photographs because it may change dramatically. But even let us be honest, um, then you are seeing patient in patient in your office in different lighting. Um, tongue may appear completely different color. So I actually have hand out my patients. There are, I have a color strip and my patient is instructed to take to ask someone from the, of their uh, people at home available to take picture of their tongue at the same time in the same circumstances in the same lighting with the uh, color strip reference beside the tongue for I could see changes and accordingly accommodate to the changes. That's a reference color strip is immensely helpful. Um, with TCM pulse, and that's the biggest, biggest obstacle what took for me about four years to figure out how to collect the pulse of the patient. I actually have written uh, a book and will be teaching um, at uh, um, Florida State Oriental Medicine Conference in August. Uh, the class on how interpret mobile AKG uh, into the TCM pulse. On this screen, you literally see the PDF which um, is uploaded via secure transmission methods which are available on um, EHR platforms or telemedicine platforms uh, um, how to collect the pulse and here is a pdf of the pulse few things which we can see very easily or if you don't know how to do that at this moment at least what you can do you can ask your patient to use any type of wearable technology which patient has and at least let you know what is their pulse rate and we know that uh, um Pulse norm is anywhere between 60 and 80 beats per minute. Anything which is below 60 is considered to be slow. Anything which is above 80 is fast. And anything which is above 110 is missing pulse. You also can see, let's say, on AKG regularity of the pulse. And in the worst case scenario, you can instruct your patients how to take their pulse and to, uh, instruct them to count their pulse simply and feel is it regular or not. That's uh, simple ways which can be implemented even uh, via telemedicine visit. So another um, uh, screen which I want to stretch out for you is uh, ICD-11 Traditional Medicine Codes Chapter 26. Better version is available. We are living in times where our medicine um, accepts more and more credibility. Standardization of the diagnostic codes is one of the steps which we must to make. So here is uh, the website for you to access better version of ICD-11, uh, Chapter 26. The screen, what you see, is a coding tool, um, which then you can just type in the search uh, screen window what you're looking for, click on the um, filter right uh, on, the, on the screen, and uh, uh, it will find for your specific pattern. Uh, then you click on the link below, it will take to initial screen and you can read a little bit more about ICD-11. Um, I will be speaking um, in subsequent classes, um, check please on some of websites uh, how ICD-11 standard terminology uh, differs from what we used to. ICD-11 terminology is based on a standard terminology manual released by World Health Organization in 2007, which actually is widely available. And it's not necessary in much um, terminology. Uh, just to give for you an example in regards of pulse, um, 
commonly what we use in United States right now is about 11 uh, different definitions of pulse. In a uh, uh, new World Health Organization released standard terminology manual, there is 48 different classifications of pulse. How do I use ICD-11 at the current moment? And even in future, it's not billable diagnosis right now, and it's probably will not be billable diagnosis even then it's uh, released and mandated. Um, billable diagnosis still remains ICD-10, and ICD-11 is an additional feature. Even right now, independently, I use uh, uh, Charm HR, which is my HR in private practice, or I use Epic uh, in Cleveland Clinic. I put as my billable diagnosis, sorry, and uh, in bold, right in here, you see, let's say, diagnosis of migraine um, without an aura not intractable. Um, and below in notes section, you see um, SF52 liver yarn ascended hyperactivity pattern. That is my uh, clarification. Why it is important for us to standardize treatments? All this data will be collected. It will be collected by World Health Organization and it will be uh, uh, collected uh, um, by insurance companies, because right now the dosage of acupuncture, and especially its first will apply to acupuncture, is a big mystery. They don't know for how many sessions, with what frequency they need to use, so they will be collecting the data, how we use it, how many uh, sessions, and so forth. So here is the end of my PowerPoint at this moment. But what I want to show for you is a few important websites where are updates are available. First of them, uh, which I want to emphasize, is our importance uh, um, for obeying the recommendations of, of our um, government legislators if you are ordered to uh, stay home and work from home uh, i am ordered in state of ohio right now we are on work from home uh, order here is the website which shows for you in real time amount of coronavirus in the world. And right now, United States is country number one on the list by amount of coronavirus infections. Part of it may be uh, the um, speed of spreading out. Part of it may be accessibility for the testing. But one of the things which I would like to put for you, that's there an importance of traditional Chinese herbal medicine is, if you take a look at the number of cases in China, it's a little over 81,000 total cases, and Italy, a little over 86,000 uh, of cases, we have the rate of mortality in China just a little above 3,000 and over 9,000 in Italy. I would assume it's not necessarily a proven fact, but I would assume that uh, the significantly lower rate of mortality in China is due to early treatment with traditional Chinese herbal medicine. But let us take a look at reality of the clinical practice and uh, uh, legal scope of practice which we have. Um, Probably we will not get an access to inpatient hospitals as a Chinese herbalists. Even as acupuncturists, there is very few of us who do inpatient acupuncture. Um, with herbs, unrealistic. It's why majority of us will not be able to treat 
acute pneumonia or other complications due to COVID-19. Our biggest duty as a practitioners at this moment is lying in prevention, treatment for our patients, at treatment of initial stages, be it Taiyan stage or be it um, way stage, according to uh, cold induced diseases or warm disease theory, and make sure that you are diagnosing the pattern, at treating the pattern. It's the most important that the safe of our medicine will be followed. And also you are acting within a legal scope of our profession. And another important application for traditional Chinese herbal medicine will be in recovery for our patient. So here is another page uh, um, for uh, um, telemedicine policies. You can see that updates are coming daily. This is a good site for you to look what is new. But please read with very big discretion. Majority of urgent changes will apply to physician and physician assistants only. They will not apply to us. It's why the next um, state that you really need to, uh, to look at, NCCOM provides a great resources for you. Then you can literally click on the on each state and don't only read the popping up window click on the state it will direct you to um, uh, regulating authority in that state and read the state law why it is important because different states regulate um, our medicine differently some states may regulate herbs explicitly some states may don't mention herbs in our scope of practice altogether. It is why it's very, very, very important for us to act within our scope of practice. So here's another uh, website, which uh, um, is important to look at, is uh, um, health information um, site for government agencies. And a last website, which is Federation for State Medical Boards, that which is the biggest advocating body for physicians. Uh, big advantage of the physician, they are united. They have exactly the same scope of practice across all of the states, which would be a, um, an important example for us to unite, uh, try to... Um, work with uh, um, your state associations and have developed the same standards. So in this uh, moment, I am done with my presentation and would like to give uh, uh, the control to uh, Jeff to run our um, questions Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so we actually have a lot of questions coming in and I assume that we will get some more while we're going to them. Um, so I'm gonna start right at, the, right at the beginning and let's go from there. Um, we did have somebody ask that there are specific people teaching telemedicine and many give the basic codes for the modifiers um, or changes to the HFFCA. Can you tell us what the modifiers are in the office, um, office changes? Um, I did let her know in the answer that you are not an expert on billing and that we will be doing a webinar on billing afterwards. Um, so any questions that have to do with billing, especially the specific codes and the modifiers, we're actually not going to get into today. Um, let's move on to the next one. Um, would you please give advice for negotiating coverage with insurers? At the moment in Vermont, insurers are not covering telemedicine. How can we negotiate with, this ins uh, with the insurance company? Uh, the same how I said, it's unfortunately will be a, a very specific, a specific patient policy. And most likely in majority of the cases, we are not on the list of the providers which will be paid for medicine um, really quickly. It is a big question. But how I 
how Jeff uh, said, I am not a billing expert in any moment. Um, always I can say, I don't bill insurance for telemedicine, nor in my private practice, nor in Cleveland Clinic. It's strictly cash basis practice accordingly to um, Ohio state law. And what are the limitations for Florida telemedicine practitioners? Uh, there is nothing in Florida statutes which prohibits us billing um, EM codes. So accordingly, uh, um, it's up uh, between you, your insurance um, biller, and the patient policy. Please refer to uh, some of site. They are amazing. They will update you on all statutes on their website, or you can uh, send them a message directly. All righty, next question is from Melinda. If licensed by NCCAOM in acupuncture, can we practice in states that accept this license? And can we recommend herbal medicine? Depends on each specific state. You can practice in the state that you are licensed. Not necessary NCCOM board certified licensed in the state that is your the biggest legal definition and accordingly you obey the state that you are licensed and act to the scope of practice of that particular state in state of ohio and state of florida those two states that are licensed scope of practice is very different so I'm assuming we have a question actually about New York City because a lot of this person's patients are in New Jersey. So theoretically, they cannot practice telemedicine with their New Jersey patients. Is that correct? Correct. You have to practice telemedicine in the state that uh, you have to be licensed in the state where a patient resides. They're physically in this moment. So if they come to see you in New York City office, they're in state of New York. The moment they connect with you from uh, home, you have to, to be licensed in New Jersey. Okay. Uh, next question is from Janice. I am the Director of Clinical Education at MUIH. Uh, we have students who were treating patients who came from out of state to see them at our school clinic. Since they are established patients, is there any wiggle room um, for them to be seen online during this unusual time? Same question. To the best of my knowledge, any uh, across state um, practice rules have not been applicable to us. Um, I believe that uh, you can uh, go specifically on the site uh, um, of uh, um, the government sites, which I gave for you. And it states that right now, practice across the state boards applicable to the physician and physician assistant doesn't say anything about us. Accordingly, we have to obey to the telemedicine rule and our acupuncture uh, license in that state as well. Do you have any info on California restrictions on TCM, DX, and herbal nutritional RX via telemedicine? Please uh, look on NCCOM uh, website and contact your California board. I am not licensed in California. There is no physical capability for me to know every single state law in smallest details. Your state association is the best source of information. So I put an answer in the um, answer um, tab for this, but I'm gonna have you say this out loud because maybe a lot of people didn't hear. Um, so you were talking about how like a normal phone call is not considered HIPAA compliant during normal, but can you clarify what you were saying about what they're doing during uh, COVID-19 pandemic? So normal time not during COVID-19. We must use HIPAA-compliant technology, which is specific telemedicine platforms, like, for example, VC, 
or other certified platforms and they have to state on their site how they are certified and how they collect in the uh, specific informed consent for telehealth uh, from the patient or your EHR platforms, which as well will be contacted on uh, the specific HIPAA compliant platforms. Only during uh, COVID-19, temporarily, very temporarily, uh, FaceTime, Skype, and phone will consider to be uh, um, compliant due to relaxed policy. But it's again, it's only temporary. And keep in mind, anything which is beyond one-to-one -one with the patient, like uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, those are absolutely not compliant. No Facebook, no Twitter, then many patients, then many patient, people can lead your conversation. It's always one-on-one. -on -one. As a healthcare provider, you are absolutely directly responsible to protect health information of the patient. Patient can actually send for you SMA or whatever they want in any given moment of time. They can go on Times Square and yell about their health conditions. But you, as a healthcare provider, must protect their information according to HIPAA. All right. Uh, next question is from Stephen. Insurance companies require a Western diagnosis, i.e. low back pain. Without this on the charts, they will deny the claims due to no diagnosis found. I have been denied in an audit by an anesthesiologist due to no clear Western diagnosis. How do you chart your notes in this regard? So there is, again, a state caveats. Like with in-state of Ohio, my patients must even to sign that uh, the specific paperwork that I informed them that if they have not seen a physician or a chiropractor for Western medical diagnosis, they uh, informed that I advised them to do so within six months. As an oriental medicine practitioners, we are not entitled to make Western medical diagnosis of disease. Like for example, um, if it is a spinal stenosis, it is a Western medical diagnosis. But low back pain is a symptom. We can make a diagnosis of symptom. In terms of COVID, we can make a diagnosis, and it is a Western medical diagnosis, which has assigned ICD-10 cod, which would be fever or cough or alternating chills and fever. It is a Western medical billable diagnosis assigned number. These sort of things we are allowed to do. It is within our scope of practice. Symptomatic diagnosis. If your insurance companies deny payment because no clear Western medical diagnosis was made, your best course of action, refer the patient to their treating physician and ask for written referral with diagnosis. The moment you have written referral with Western medical diagnosis, you can use this diagnosis for your billing purposes. You just reflect in the patient notes that according to physician such and such, Please see attached written note, uh, patient was treated with, for such and such diagnosis. All righty, next question is from Danielle. Will you be offering a model for telemedicine consent forms? Um, yes, uh, there are, are specific uh, forms. Uh, um, it's a little bit too much to go through the specific consent at the current moment. Uh, um, I do have a paid version of the class. There are uh, samples of, a, of the uh, specific informed consent available. All right, and just so everybody knows that Galena is offering a discount off, off of this class, which is gonna be 20%. And there's an email that's gonna be going out five minutes after that will have a link to that. And that's gonna go into a lot of depth into, into the topics and many more. Um, so I do recommend that if you do pursue, you know, want to pursue telemedicine to look into that class. Um, next question was, 
from Robert, that's actually a good question, is he didn't see much of a difference between the free, uh, the free platforms and VC, which is $49 a month. Can you speak a little bit to that? The biggest difference is ability of the patient to share documentation, like upload pictures of tongue and pulse, and ability of you to build a patient. Because across the state, in majority of the cases, it still will remain cash paid service. Majority of the paid platforms allow you to collect uh, credit card information for the patient. And it's very worth to pay $49 uh, um, per month the platform versus lose uh, the payment whatsoever. One unpaid appointment by the patient and its entire price for entire month subscription. That is the biggest difference. Um, let's say... Um, uh, and I have a link in my class. I talked with VC platform and uh, um, actually negotiated discounted rate for our practitioners. So that was quite a while ago. It was before the COVID. Uh, there is a direct uh, link to email to the marketing person on um, in their company. I hope that they will still uh, honor my agreement. You can refer to the class. Uh, you also can subscribe to uh, un Unified Practices, which would be a great platform for you to use independently is it in time of COVID or uh, the time beyond. And at the current moment, they will not add any additional charges for uh, telemedicine. And uh, you can uh, save um, credit card of patient on file and you will have a links to the billing companies and so forth. So welcome to modern times and use modern technologies. There is immense possibilities. And it's mm, pretty important probably for all our profession to use uh, uh, unified notes, to use really resources which are geared specifically for us. Like unified practices, they have a lot of additional full information from herbal descriptions to protocols to handouts to referrals for billing services. So it's up for you, of course, to decide what you want to do. And I see on that rolling screen, what about Zoom? Um, free Zoom platform at the current time probably will work. But in regular time, you have to use medical Zoom. And medical Zoom costs $200 a month, which is absolutely cost prohibitive for us. And a big disadvantage of even medical Zoom platform, which is, again, platform which Charm HR uses, is just a dark screen. There is absolutely nothing. And uh, let's say VC or other specific um, telemedicine apps do have uh, a virtual waiting room for the patient. And actually, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Unified Practice also will have really pr pretty soon patient portal, including a waiting room for uh, the patient. All right, we have lots more questions. So I hope you're okay with hanging in with us for a little bit more. Um, so Jerry asked, for complimentary no-charge phone consultations on established patients, do I need to request their consent and go into diagnosis? You still must, in majority of the state, you still must request your consent for telemedicine. And uh, if you're using not necessary a HIPAA-compliant telemedicine platform, you must specify for the patient which platform you are using and uh, reflect it in your notes what you are using and that it is temporary and that patient consented. Um, that is the biggest reason why... Um, HIPAA compliance was relaxed, but because a lot of uh, um, patients would uh, um, successful to complications with COVID and needs to be protected the most are elderly. And very many elderly don't use computers. They even don't have smartphones to use any type of Zoom or Skype or FaceTime. All what they have is a flip phone. It's why you are obtaining verbal patient consent, especially if they are the, their established patient. If they're a new patient, 
it's probably not a good idea to accept as a new patient because you would need um, a written consent to comply with your regular state law to practice telemedicine or regular medicine, regular oriental medicine. All right, next question. Patients have a fixed number of sessions covered by the insurance companies. Will a telemedicine session be counted as one full session? Um, again, I'm not a billing professional. I probably not equipped to answer on this question. And then um, you were talking about your platform that you use earlier, and can you just share the name of that one more time? It's Charm EHR. Uh, the only reason why I'm using it because uh, um, I needed a patient portal and I'm using Charm EHR for many years now. Do I like it? No, I do not. Do I advise it? Not necessarily. I didn't have much choice. Um, the main reason why I use that particular platform because of cost effectiveness uh, and that it was offered in telemedicine um, options. I contacted Unified Practices like more than a year ago about telemedicine platform. They didn't have that option back then. Um, it's very difficult to set up Charm ER. They're not geared to us. There is no any additional information. You will have to create all of your notes, uh, note templates from scratch and everything else from scratch. It takes a long time to get accustomed to the platform. It's not very easy for patients to use. Uploading of the documentation is a nightmare. So I just simply didn't have any other choice. Now, in my practice, I will be switching to uh, unified practices. This is much more uh, user-friendly and much more acupuncturist-friendly platform. Well, Unified Practice and then also Jane App were both developed by acupuncturists, so they're made with acupuncturists in mind. And now both services are going to be offering these you know, telemedicine options, which is really great. Um, so it's really nice to see them supporting the industry this way. Um, we actually have a few questions that are exactly the same. People want to know about maybe doing like a group class on Tai Chi or Qigong. Um, is that something that is okay to do via telemedicine and via video? Anything we would within your state scope of practice. That's a very easy answer. <laughs> uh, next question is from Stephen. Do you have the source that states objective evidence of tongue and pulse uh, satisfies objective information documentation requirement that can be referred during audits and be included in audits when a non-acupuncturist is reviewing our notes? This is very common, by the way. So um, it is within our education. Uh, refer to your four pillars of patient evaluation. Yes, we have uh, listening, we have questioning, and we have a science of tongue and pulse. Right now, at the current moment, and that there is one of the problems of our practitioner of our uh, profession. There is no clear definition of uh, uh, practice standards, which is unified for all of the states. This is something for us as a profession still to uh, unite and write down very clearly. But um, by commonly accepted or customary and usual, yes, that is the phrase, customary and usual, Objective science, which across all of the states we are mandated to gather, is tongue and pulse. Any type of lab work, ordering, or anything like that, it's very state-specific. But tongue and pulse is usual and customary for our profession. Accordingly, it has to be gathered during a virtual visit as well. All righty. Next one's from Ken. Uh, where do you get the color strips that you mentioned? Uh, I have a handout uh, available for you to download on my uh, paid class website. Okay, perfect. And then do you, have, do you have to have malpractice insurance in all the states that you practice in? Um, Acupuncture Council uh, extended their coverage for telemedicine to all of us. 
Um, Marilyn Allen uh, sent for all of us email uh, stating that yes, it is within our insurance uh, without additional charge. The only thing which you need to do, you need to contact the acupuncture council and uh, make sure that you inform them that you are uh, providing telemedicine. All right, and then Gina says, I see practitioners using both telemedicine and telehealth, which is correct. Some think it's not safe to call our service telemedicine. What is the correct term legally? Refer to telemedicine law specific to your state. Uh, they, in some of them, they can be used interchangeably. It can be telemedicine, it can be uh, telehealth. Alrighty, and then next one's from Gina. How can you practice outside of your state legally? What if you have an online program and people from out of state buy it and it includes herbal medicine? Is that legal? No, it's not. Okay. And next one, uh, can you go over specific consent forms we need to have the patient sign before doing telemedicine? Sorry, I realized we already answered that. Um, there are versions of these consent forms in Galena's full class that she offers. Um, I'm sure there's also other resources online where you can find some, uh, you know, language to add to your consent forms. And then also the other night uh, when you lectured for Pasoma, um, you had mentioned that in some places it's okay to just notate it in your records, correct? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, let's say um, if you are providing telehealth or telemedicine or virtual appointment services for your established elderly patient via the phone, you can gather their informed consent to a telehealth appointment via the phone and record it in notes that it was verbal consent of the patient to have the appointment with you via the phone during uh, COVID-19. But it's only during COVID-19. The moment all this emergency is lifted, we will be back to normal HIPAA compliant software. And for any one of them, you know, I have experience with my own mom um that uh, uh she was oh i don't computer i don't need computer i don't want to do it i don't want the smartphone or anything like that and my mom still lives in her native country the moment skype became available and she actually can see me she very quickly learned how to operate computer and how to <laughs> operate smartphone and everything else if your patients want to see you on regular basis via telemedicine. Like I have patients who drive to me a um, few hours. Mm, what do they go, you know, I live higher. So we have a lot of snowbirds. They want to see me. So they very quickly learn then they move for the winter time to Florida and want to communicate. All right, uh, next one's from Eileen. If we are prescribing a preventative formula for the COVID-19, do we still need to make a complete exam and diagnosis? Uh, yes, you still have to uh, make a complete exam and diagnosis and reflect in your notes that at the current moment, patient is asymptomatic for uh, COVID, uh, um, but patient has such and such underlying conditions and such and such formula is indicated. And I'm so sorry, guys, I'm moving my computer is running out of power. So I have to grab uh, the cord and I apologize for uh, my screen moving. Well, thank you very much for explaining that. <laughs> uh, do you give you a second before I ask you, uh, the next question? Uh, no, we are absolutely fine. It's just I have 10% le left on my computer. So I'm trying uh, to help and provide for my computer some food. All right. Well, we actually still more questions just pot rolling in. So. Uh, next question is, um, have you heard whether or not testing kits will be available to TCM providers? So for the um, short period of time, professional call, which is uh, um, the company which negotiated for us as a provider of traditional chain medicine, opportunity to order conventional lab work, um, through LabCorp 
had some of the tests available, but to the um, best of my knowledge, literally in less than a day, they returned back with the email that all of the tests were used and sorry, we are out. <laughs> but it is professional co-op website they um don't offer their services in every state but many of the states and especially for us as uh, practitioners to be able to offer conventional medical tests for cash patients they're very important prices are negligible in many cases cash uh, prices for uh lab core will be lower than uh, insurance copy for testing. All right. Um, so actually, the next question might actually be for me and Lhasa OMS. Um, so the herbal medicine that we need right now is not available. All of the suppliers are showing them as out of stock. How can we find herbal formulas and or single herbs more easily? Um, so you know, I'll actually take that one. Um, so we are working with all of the manufacturers and all of the distributors of Chinese herbs in the US to try and make sure that we have these products available. It's just really difficult because the demand has increased so much in a very short amount of time that it was just really hard for these different manufacturers to catch up. Um, we've spoken to almost all of them, if not all of them. They are working with their manufacturers and their um, contacts in China and Taiwan to make sure that they have all of these herbs available. Uh, we recently got a big shipment in of some of the most popular formulas that have been out of stock. Um, so if you check out lasaoms.com and look for these particular formulas or single herbs that you're looking for, uh, for single herbs, we have them in green, sun 10, uh, TCM zone and KPC. Um, so hopefully within one of those, you know, brands, we would have those herbs that you're needing. And then for some of these very popular flows that have been flying off the shelf, uh, we have been limiting people to either five or eight bottles, depending on the popularity of them as a way to try and curb the fear buying and to make sure we have stock for as many practitioners as possible. Uh, we do apologize for any you know, inconvenience it causes you, uh, but everyone is doing their very best at this time to you know, keep up with the demand for these herbal formulas. Next question will be for you. Um, this is, can physicians, MDs, and DOs with herbal training conduct telemedicine for herbal therapies? So uh, that there is pretty interesting caveats. Um, herbal medicine is, is not well defined. Even for us, every state has a completely different language in uh, regards of herbs. Like for example, uh, currently um, in state of Arizona, there is absolutely nothing mentioned in herbs, not at all. So, in regards of acupuncture, to the best of my knowledge, any state except of Hawaii requires for MD to have zero hours of education in order to practice acupuncture. Majority of them will finish at least a medical acupuncture class. In regards of herbs, I probably even will not start. All right, we'll move on. Uh, can you please speak to, oh, we already talked about that. Um, that will go through EHR, so speak to consent forms and digital signatures, and more information on this would be available in Galena's full class. Um, somebody wants to know if there'll be a list of these websites noted. Um, everyone's receiving a copy of the slides, whether going in an email that you actually already received and one you'll get after we conclude. Um, so you all have access to that information. Um, Elizabeth wants to know if you can best using acupressure for a person over telemedicine, hard to figure out how to charge private pay for treatment. I'm licensed in herbal medicine too, but that's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, you can do via telemedicine pretty much anything which is within your scope of practice. Please read your state law. In majority of the cases, they are pretty, pretty easy and pretty specific. They do say that any healthcare provider can act within their state scope of practice. The only thing which I would not advise for you to do, 
please do not offer for your patients ear tuck needles or anything which is invasive. So nothing which pierces the skin. And especially with ear tucks, that there is the biggest amount of uh, uh, infections. There is a big risk for somebody else to step on the on uh, ear tuck needle. Uh, so we don't do it uh, um, even in um, inpatient practice. Otherwise, you can even instruct them to use any seeds um, or wh whatever means of stimulation of uh, uh, puncture point, be it acupressure or seeds or whatever. It should be within your scope of practice. But again, refer to your state scope of practice. Um, the next question is about um, custom formula. So how can we have all the ingredients listed on an herbal formula bottle when we are making the custom formula at the time of the patient visit? That's uh, the importance of usage of uh, uh, EMR platforms comes in place. To the best of my knowledge, unified practice allows for you to maintain your own inventory and it has capabilities to print a label for you, HIPAA compliant, excuse me, FDA compliant label. I use uh, uh, Crane Herbs and uh, uh, it's amazing. Takes for me literally a few seconds to create the custom formula. Uh, it's all compliant, uh, uh, all of the herbs are listed. All which I and there is even an option uh, to do it in text format. I copy and paste it in my records. Um, simple and easy. Um, it's all outlined in my um, class. You know because r right now we have such a short time. It's impossible to give for you uh, full directions. But it, it's it's all possible. It's why it's important to have a modern technology. There are capabilities. All right. The next one is from Ro. Does the informed consent forms for existing patients they have already filled out at a first visit count as informed consent for telemedicine visit? They do not because you have to add the verbiage of telemedicine. Okay. So new consent forms. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry. Um, can we use the Western medicine given on diagnostic reports such as MRIs? Um, repeat one more time the question, please. Uh, we use the Western medicine given on diagnostics. Oops. Uh, can we use the Western medicine given on diagnostic reports such as MRIs? Um, refer to your state law. The safest option, which works across the entire country, if you have a written referral from MD. That then you have a written paper, which you can supply with your notes to insurance company. And that then there is no any arguments about. Right. Jeff, you are interrupting. Hello? Yes, now it's better. Okay, perfect. Um, there seems to be a bunch of questions about how do you determine the fee to charge for telehealth without having to give an exact number? Is there a formula or a way that somebody can, you know, come up with a reasonable fee for these services? So to the best of my knowledge, and again, I'm not a billing professional, there is a formula how to determine the fees. But also uh, contact your state association, uh, go on the uh, medical board of your state. Some of them release the statements specifically for COVID that uh, um, insurance companies are obligated to pay the same fee for telemedicine like uh, for um, in-person appointment. But it's state specific, so work with your state. Okay. Let's say uh, I just received that update from uh, Lloyd um, in Arizona. That's what their governor released specifically. And it's not on regular um, uh, site. It's why your state association is your best uh, source of information. They will be updated by legal team and uh, um, the gov government officials the quickest. 
Okay, and actually I skipped a question by mistake. It looks right. like there was a question about the out-of-state patients where reside versus where the practitioner is licensed. Does this only apply to insurance billing or is this just in general? In general, it's a state okay. law. State law, okay. Sorry about missing that one. Um, let's see. And then somebody asked, is a phone session considered face-to-face? It does not consider it face-to-face. -face. It's why you need to note in your uh, notes that uh, during COVID, session was, held face, uh, session was held on the phone because patient doesn't have an access to uh, any other means of visual face-to-face -face technology. To cover all your odds, that's something which I would put in. Uh, within, um, let's say, Cleveland Clinic, we have a specific ways of uh, uh, eChart and, and ePhone and so forth. But in private practices, it's probably not available. That would be your uh, biggest legal protection. All righty. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked to please spell the name of the platform you were using, and that was Charm, so C-H-A-R-M, so Charm, E-H-R. Um, somebody was asking about Doxy.me platform. It is a HIPAA compliant and lower fees than Zoom Healthcare. So Doxy.me and VC are fairly compatible. Price is about the same. The free version of Doximy does not allow to charge the patient before the appointment. That is the biggest difference between paid platform and free platform. Uh, if you have a patient credit card on file, you can take a risk on free platform. But if you don't have a patient credit card on file, you can't. And unfortunately, the time which you will spend on the phone gathering patient billing information is not considered to be an assessment. It's not a billable time or not, uh, let's say, not a professional charge patient for that. They deserve every single minute to be spent with you assessing their condition. It's why paid platform then patient enters credit card information before they log in and initiate appointment with you is the best way to go, which is paid. All right. Uh, next question is, it's actually, are you going to be teaching a class on how to interpret the EKG and TCM pulse diagnosis? Yes, I will. Uh, there will be a, a brief three hours introduction um, at Florida State uh, Oriental Medicine Association conference in August in Fort Lauderdale. This year, and as well, uh, the more full version, uh, 12, C, uh, 12 CD, CEUs, 12 PDAs version, uh, then it's much more in details available, most likely in uh, September. Uh, please check my website. All righty. Um, let's see. Somebody says, I may be beating a dead horse, but a web class on a specific pain acupressure protocol for low back pain patients, um, would that be a HIPAA problem? As long as you are acting within your scope of practice, it's not. But keep in mind that any type of prescription uh, based on questionnaire only is not a, considered to be a practice um, or good practice. So it's uh, not a legal thing to do. It's why there has to be a patient assessment and more specific recommendations for the patient. But as long as you're providing any type of recommendations for the patient, which is within your scope of practice in the state where you are licensed and there a patient resides, you act in good. All right, so you know, we have lots of questions still rolling in. So if there's a hard time that you need to stop or if you're getting tired, just let me know and we can always send the questions to you and anything that you're able to answer. Um, you know, we can always email that out to the group. So just keep that in mind. Um, let me know, you know, if you're if you need to stop at all.
Um, but we have more questions, so I can keep answer, uh, asking them if you're able to answer. Yeah, let's just try at least to uh, plan next 10 minutes, absolutely. All right, so we're going to keep going for about 10 minutes. Any questions after that, we will um, send those to Galena to answer afterward, and then we'll email those out to the group. Um, so Mary says, in Florida telemedicine law, I read that other practitioners from out of state can practice telemedicine in Florida. Is this true? And we cannot practice in other states? Question mark. Uh, at the time of COVID-19, uh, law has been relaxed. Is it applicable specifically to oriental medicine practitioner? Please read the law. Uh, sometimes it specifies that it's physician and physician assistants only. Sometimes it's not. Uh, updates are rolling in uh, so quickly that I have unfortunately no opportunity to uh, track them all. It's why Florida State Oriental Medicine Association is your best resource. And again, your state association is your best resource. It's impossible to track every single state. And please keep in mind, I'm on work from home order. So I still see my virtual patients as in Cleveland Clinic, as in my private practice. So I'm with busy. So your state association, please. They're good. They, they work in very hard for you. And especially in Florida, probably FSOMA is one of the best associations around and cares for us a lot. And I have seen in our rolling bar uh, uh, some comment about donations. On um, At least on Florida State, I know for sure there are some donation options. I'm pretty sure that any other state, please contact uh, your associations. Please donate uh, money to legal funds and um, everything else to support your associations. They're working hard and they all are volunteers. They're not getting paid for it. So, and for us to unite, um, it's important. Um, we were uh, very fortunate, thanks to NCCOM and uh, um, other um, associations, we were able to um, at least to obtain the professional designation in Bureau of Labors. They have a really nice description for uh, our profession. Now we just need to follow and adjust our states to that law description because that uh, description of our profession includes creation and management, which is very important and that would open a lot of doors for us. Um, but support your associations. All right. And I just actually put a link to the ASA in the chat. So if you're not sure you know, how to find your state association, if you go to the ASA, all of the ASA approved associations will be listed there. Um, just so you are aware. Uh, next question is from Adam. Uh, if we cannot prescribe herbs to patients in other states, how can we help those patients herbs? Refer them to the uh, practitioner in the state. Uh, one of the things which I do, um, because you know I cannot provide acupuncture for my Florida uh, patients. And in Cleveland Clinic, we have a lot of shared classes for pain management, for other classes for our patients and uh, a lot of snowbirds. I do refer them to uh, um, Florida State Association, uh, which will help them to find the practitioners. And if you are not sure or don't have a link to the specific state association, or if association does not maintain the list of the professionals, NCCOM has uh, find the practitioner. It's the best resource. Perfect. All righty, and then um, it seems like a lot of repeat questions want to waste your time. Um, so when you are doing your session, how do you get an EKG reading to check the pulse? And where is training for this with differences, how to actually see the tongue properly, and how much do you charge? It is in uh, my class, it's a long question. Um, I charge for my telemedicine appointments exactly the same which I charge uh, for in-person visits. I do operate on cash basis just again because by state of Ohio and majority of my patients are Ohioans, so I cannot bill eval codes, so I act on cash basis. Okay, uh, let's see. 
So I think we've talked about this a few times, but there seems to be a lot of questions coming in about it. So new patients versus established patients telehealth. Some of the states telehealth law will specify, like for example, Florida telemedicine law specifically has a sentence that we can establish relationships with the patient for a initial visit via telemedicine. Some may not. Uh, in billing regards, to the best of my knowledge, all billing codes for telemedicine are established. So I can give for them um, the code if uh, they want to submit uh, um, super bill to their insurance uh, company reflecting the code, but chances to get paid uh, sp sparse. But at least... Again, to the best of my knowledge, please refer to your state as telemedicine, as acupuncture law. There has to be a specific sentence if it prohibits telemedicine via initial visit. In state of Ohio, in my acupuncture uh, scope of practice, or actually uh, oriental medicine practitioner scope of practice, there is a sentence that initial appointment must be in person. It's why right now, in time of COVID, I see only established patients in my practice in obedience of the law, and it has not changed with COVID because it's our law. It's not telemedicine law. Righty. Uh, we'll do a, a few more questions, and then we'll let you go. Um, is, uh, is recording the session with a patient a requirement for telemedicine? Not in any means. Okay. okay. And then, actually, it looks like the last question is for me. Um, is Lhasa doing direct mail of herbs to patients? And I'm sorry if this has been asked for. No need to apologize. Um, so any order that's placed through Lhasa OMS website is essentially a drop ship because there's no invoice with pricing that's included. It's just hacking slips. So they will not be able to see the pricing that you were charged for these herbs. That's the only thing that's going to be in there is what's in the box. And we don't sell direct to patients. So they have no way to order directly from us. So if you place an order at our website and it, you ship it to the patient and you pay with your credit card, then that is perfectly acceptable and the patient will not see how much you were charged for that. In the next week or two, we are working on a solution for an affiliate program. We will let everyone know as soon as we find it, as soon as we have the exact details on this, but it is something we are working on extremely fast to get that out to you guys as soon as humanly possible. So with that being said, I think we have answered pretty much every question that came in. I cannot thank you enough for joining us today, Galena. This has been extremely informational. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to say to the group before I let you go? Yes, one of the things which I would, would like to stress out for our profession, and uh, I'm in the same boat like everyone else, and um, it is hard to lose income. But please remember, lives of the patients and safety of the patient are more important. If your state uh, and county prompted to shut down your clinic, please do so. Please see patients only virtually. And one of the reasons being, it's not are, is, are we essential profession or not essential profession. It's all about availability of protective supplies. And let's us to make sure that those professionals who deal with acutely ill, infectious patients or patients who require emergency surgeries have an access to gloves and masks and other protective sanitizing equipment. And the sparse supplies are not consumed uh, by us, which uh, very rarely anyone will die if we don't for acupuncture immediately. It's almost unheard about, but they can die if there is no emergency surgery available. Please be considerate about that. Well, thank you very much. So for anyone who's wondering, there will be a replay made available immediately after we stop. So if you stay on this page, you'll be able to watch it almost immediately. Five minutes after we end, which will be in just a moment, you will all receive an email that will have a link to the recording, a link to the slides, links to some resources that Galena has provided. There's a handout. There's also information for the full class if you're interested in learning more. Uh, that is good for four CEUs, two for safety, two for ethics. 
I want to thank everyone for taking some time on a, you know, early on a Saturday. Um, you know, we're thinking of all of you during these very difficult times, and we plan to have more events like this for webinars. Um, it could be, you know, pre pre um, practice management, it could be treatment, but we're going to try to keep everybody together as a community during these difficult times. Thank you again for offering your services today. This was really amazing and informational. We hope you all have a wonderful Saturday and a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. And just uh, you know, a little announcement that uh, I try to support my state associations as much as I possibly can. And part of the proceeds of my paid class is actually uh, uh, donated to FSOMA. And it's one of the reasons why uh, CEUs for uh, FSOMA posted to CE broker by FSOMA. So thank you very much. Thank and you. hopefully this I can help as much as I can. Well, thank you. You helped a lot today. And this event was co-sponsored by FSOMA with the Florida State Oriental Medical Association. You can visit their website, which is fsoma.org. They're holding uh, Facebook Live and Zoom webinars almost every week on practice management. They're doing a lot on the COVID-19 pandemic, so please stay tuned with them or your state, state association. Thank you again. Thank you, Galette. And again, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.